Harry Trigaboff is a property mogul worth around $23 billion, according to Forbes. He is one of Australia's most successful businessmen. And I was lucky enough to sit down with him and talk about Australia's property crisis, the work ethic of younger generations, and why we fight so hard to protect our own home. Well, I just wanted to talk to you mostly about this big picture idea of I grew up wanting the great Australian dream and buying into that of owning your own home, a quarter acre block. How does that change now? Do you think it's a bad thing? People should own their own home. It's a, it's a very big thing. <laughs> if you look at Ukraine, they fight so well because it's their home. If you look at Afghanistan, the American soldier was not fighting for his home. Mm. So you see the, the, the connection that the person has with his own home. It's, that, that's sim simple, as simple as that. Uh, it changes your psyche, doesn't it? Yeah. And, and you feel like you've got a spot in the world almost. Well, of course, yeah. of, course of course. That's what you have. And that usually has to go up, keep going up in price. Mm. It's very bad if the prices don't continuously go up. It's very bad. I mean, it doesn't mean that they have to shoot up all the time, but they should gradually go up, like we expect everything else to go up. So this should go up too, in the same manner as everything else. And that's very important. Because then they also have something that's their own. This, uh, this other way, uh, that nothing is his own. He has a bit of that with that. So anyway, very important that we, and in the past, all the people had their homes, very few rented. And that is why their children and grandchildren have a bit of money because they had the houses and they went up in price and they got the money. Now, if they didn't buy the house, <laughs> then the children wouldn't have the money. Indeed. Or very little money, right. How many homes have you built in Australia? Do you know? Uh, 75,000. 75? Uh, 75,000, yeah. Well, so I've been building for 60 years. Every day. And what motivates you? Is it because we've talked about how important it is to have that feeling and own your own home, and you've created, you know, seventy-five thousand homes for people. They've gone on to create wealth because property prices have gone up. Do you so, ever reflect on that? It's very nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's like me asking a doctor how many lives he, see, he saves. Yeah. <laughs> Same thing, you know. Looking at the, the targets, I mean, the, the housing crisis is front and centre, finally. You know, all levels of government are talking about it. We've got this target from the federal government, 1.2 million homes. I mean, can you see how that can be done? And is anyone on track to do it? No. They just talk about it. And uh, they <laughs> have no idea how to do it because they have a problem. A politician has a problem that first and foremost, he looks after himself to get votes. It's not only here, it's all over the world. A democracy has politicians, politicians need votes to get in. Now, <laughs> that already gives him a problem because to get in, he might think, he doesn't have to approve. Huh? Yeah. So for many years, I had two big people that I fought, the Liberal Party and the Labour Party. Mm -hmm. They both fought me. They never fought each other, they fought me. Why? Because if they attacked units, then they would get votes. Because in their minds, everybody wanted to have a house. Mm -hmm. So therefore, if they attacked me, both would get votes. So, mm -hmm. huh? They both get votes. At the moment, though, the situation is so bad <laughs> that they're quite happy to have apartments. <laughs> so that argument doesn't last anymore, and that helps me a lot. 
because now they don't fight me at all, because <laughs> they, now they both want and to you, work with me. You say governments, both state, federal, uh, and we can throw in the councils here, they don't really know what to do. They're not moving in the right direction, and they are, well, from, from what I can see, they're kind of paralysed by indecision. And, and what you're talking about is not wanting to upset anyone. There's a bit of nimbyism going on. I think Chris Minns is trying to make some headway there, whether it's, you know, just a front for the, the media and saying all the right things and doing different things behind the scenes but what is the first step because if you can't release this land do it and you've got protests and people pushing back where's the best place to build they are so tough that really most developers are broke so he can release land as much as he likes the guy hasn't got money to build that's a far bigger problem than his problem of releasing land that's a problem, isn't it? If we can Releasing land know, is just a stroke of the you, pen. The developers can't afford to develop. Well, they, 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 you, you don't see... Uh, well, well, you, you look at all the development companies, mm. none of them have done well in the last few years. Mm. And that is because it is so difficult. All the foreigners came to build here, none of them did well. They all ran away. Now, they all can't be dumb. And they're not dumb, and they, and they work, and they want to succeed. But as I say, the, we have to sit together and work out how we can succeed. And what do you think about young people and our work, our work ethic? I think I'm still going to call myself young in this conversation. No. <laughs> not the best. No? no? What do you see? Before, we all knew that we had to work, mm. and we accepted it. And now we start saying, oh, well, I, I, I like to work, but I also like not to work, and this and that. Not good. Now, the women, I find, are much better. They're more reliable. Yeah? They work. All right. The guys, not the best. So thank God they, they're married, so one of them is good anyway. <laughs> the other one is just so-so. <laughs> but anyway, that, that's my view, you know. Is there at any point where the level of wealth becomes a burden as well? No. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, the tax department asks my people, where is my boat, where is my aeroplane, where are all the things that people have? I say, I have no time for it. <laughs> It's wonderful to have a boat and stuff, but I just have no time. Uh, what I do here, I like more than I like on a boat, so why bother? Wow. So you'd rather be at work than yeah, on a boat? Yeah, of course. And that's the key to all this success, do something that you love. That's one of the big things, yes. Yeah. Do you think it's easy for people to be able to find do something that they love? Well, that, I think it's not easy. Mm. Because when I came here, I had enough money to buy a little cottage in North Shore somewhere. <laughs> and so I had to decide what to do. I tried this, I tried that, I tried many different things. Eventually I did that. It didn't take long, like a year or two, but it took that. Mm. So you, you must look and you must find what you are happy with. Mm. It's not the amount of money you make. That's not that. It's you have to be happy at your work. And you have to look for that. It won't come by itself. I think that's very important. Indeed. Tell me you spend some of your money on things that you absolutely enjoy. You drink fine wine, do you wear fine suits, do you wear expensive shoes? Something, Harry. Give it to me. <laughs> what Mines, I spend? No boats. I don't spend money. I don't know. <laughs> I, I spent a lot of money on on the tigers, you know, but but they can't win, so I so I gave up. But I, I spent lots of money on them for years and years. I spent a lot of money on the Jewish education. Yes. Why? Because I I would like Judaism to survive. And uh, the only way to survive is to have Jewish schools. 
And I come from a small place in China, and where well, no, the place is big, but a small population in that city. And we had a Jewish school. So I think from the beginning, I thought that having a Jewish school is very important. Mm -hmm. And so when they, we came here, one of the first things I did is I spent a lot of money on Jewish schools. Very important for me. Right. Would you like to talk about what you think the solution is in Israel right now? I, I thought about that, but I, I wouldn't. I, no. I, it wouldn't be any good. First of all, I'm not there, so I already don't know as much as I should. Mm -hmm. And then they wouldn't listen to me, so... <laughs> I don't know about that. And, and me. <laughs> I leave it to them. <laughs> well, Harry, it's been a pleasure. And as I said to you at the beginning, I wanted to talk to you for so long just about, you know, your attitude to, to business and success. Right. And I think your messages to young people and even people, you know, maybe reaching success in their latter years is really important. And I think we've covered all your advice, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Just, just because you're old doesn't mean you, you're going to give up. That's only yeah. even more fun. Do you think people talk to you um, with the assumption that you might retire one day? Because I'm not doing that now, just to be clear. No, no, no. Well, <laughs> of course, if I'm not well, I'll retire, yeah. Mm. But otherwise, I'll be here, yeah. You never retire? No. Harry Triggerboff there in Rude Health. Uh, very truthful in his advice uh, to government, to young people and everyone else in between. That conversation was an absolute pleasure. So